Pike and he will tell us about the Veil Algebra for double the algebraid. Uh, okay, thanks for the introduction. I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to this beautiful place to give a talk and for all their hard work, not only on this conference, but also on the school that was given last week. Those of us that were there know it was excellent, and so I have every reason to believe that the conference will be as well. Okay, so as mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about Bay algebras for double structures. So we're gonna talk about double structures a lot today. And I might reference the school as motivation a couple of times, but those of you that were there in the school would have seen a few examples of these that pop up in various aspects of Poisson geometry and Lie theory. Uh, for example, uh, Enrique talked about an example, which is the cotangent of a Lie group being a double Lie group. And we also talked a little bit about Poisson Lie groups, which are a compatible Poisson Lie structure. Uh, you can even take that one step further, talk about Poisson groupoids, and then the object integrating a Poisson groupoid would be a symplectic double groupoid. Okay, so these double structures come up in the context of trying to put even more structure on an algebraid or a groupoid or a Poisson manifold, et cetera. Uh, so at the risk of having a bit too much preamble, I should also say that the slides are available on my website if you want to follow along or if I manage to pique your interest, you want to take a look after. And if I really manage to pique your interest, you can take a look at the preprint, uh, which is available online, that this talk is based on, and it's joint work with Eckerd, and it's going to appear later in the IMRM. Okay, I'll point it at this one. Uh, so here's a brief outline of what we're gonna talk about. So we're gonna talk about these double structures, as I mentioned, and what we're gonna con look at is uh, a certain construction of this double complex that essentially determines uh, the structure of the double E algebraid. So DLA will always mean double E algebraid from now on. First, I'm just going to give you an introduction, very brief. I'm just going to remind you uh, what Veil algebra means in the context of a Lie algebra, okay? And then I'm gonna introduce the construction that we're gonna look at. This Veil algebra should be a double complex, um, and you can construct it, uh, just the underlying algebra, without uh, differentials, using just for the structure of double vector bundles. So you can associate to any dub double vector bundle, a bigraded uh, bundle of algebras, and so I'll introduce that construction. In order to get differentials on it, that's when we need to start introducing Lie structures. So when we have a double Lie algebraid, we'll get these two commuting differentials that make this uh, underlying veil algebra into a complex, and then we'll look at where these things appear and relationships to uh, various aspects of the literature. So let me remind you just Ve algebra for a regular Lie algebra. So we have a Lie algebra G. The Veil algebra is given by this graded tensor product of the uh, symmetric powers and the anti-symmetric powers. So one way, if you like to think about this, would be uh, forms, or maybe even you could think of them as polynomials with values in the uh, exterior algebra. And this comes with a Cartan calculus on it, okay? so. Uh, even just in the case of a vector space, this will have a differential given by the usual Kozul formula. And when you have a Lie algebra, you get another differential uh, coming from the chevalier eilenberg differential, uh, where here we're looking at the coadjoint action uh, and then uh, extending it to the symmetric powers. Okay. The contractions are zero on the symmetric part and the usual thing on the anti-symmetric part. And the Lie derivatives, they get extended by the coadjoint action to this whole space. Okay. And this has all the Cartan's magic formula, the usual Cartan relations among Lie derivatives, interior products, and differentials. This has been generalized to the setting of Lie algebraids. So instead of just a Lie algebra, we can construct a bundle of vigrated algebras associated with any Lie algebraid. Um, it's done by Raj in his thesis, and Abadan Krynich gave another description of it in more classical terms. Okay, uh, another, so to tell a slightly different story, uh, when we study uh, Lie algebraids, it was shown uh, by Weintraub that these are the same thing as looking at homological vector fields on a certain uh, space. So A1 is a supermanifold that you can associate to any vector bundle, and then this means the sort of sheaf of functions on this supermanifold, and you can show that 
the algebraic structures on the vector bundle are basically equivalent to homological vector fields. Uh, in sort of more classical terms, you could think of this as the, this is basically the chevalier eilenberg complex. This is telling us that we can uh, understand a Lie algebraid by looking at its chevalier eilenberg complex, and differentials on that complex uh, are the same thing as Lie algebraid structures on the vector bundle. So it's natural to ask if you can do this uh, for double Lie algebraids. So by double Lie algebraid, I'll mean in the sense of McKenzie, who got it by, got the definition by differentiating uh, twice the concept of a double Lie groupoid. Uh, and it basically it gives you some, uh, what you have is a square like this where everything is a Lie algebraid subject to some further compatibility conditions. So I should mention now that when I use these double arrows, that will always mean it's a Lie algebraid structure. Uh, I learned this from your paper, Enrique, uh, Matias, and Alejandro's paper. I don't know if uh, you guys are the first ones to use it, but it's very useful for double structures because sometimes I'll want some of these to be vector bundles and sometimes I'll want them to be Lie algebraids. And so to draw the picture quickly and explain what it means, this is the notation I'll be using. And this question was answered by Voronov. So in an analogous way, using super geometry uh, to the total space, you can identify a bi-graded bi supermanifold. And then you're looking at two homological vector fields uh, on this uh, sheaf of functions. So the story we're going to tell today is we're going to look at an underlying double vector bundle, the space underlying a double E algebraid. And we're going to look at a construction of this bundle of bi-graded algebras. And in the case that A is a Lie algebraid, it turns out the tangent of A is a double Lie algebraid. And we want uh, our construction for the tangent of A to agree with the usual Weyl algebra of a uh, Lie algebraid. And we would like the space of sections of that bundle to give this space. And that way, then, uh, double Lie algebraid structure on this underlying DVB should be a double complex structure on this bi-graded algebra. Okay. Now, <laughs> I don't want to offend anyone, so I should mention right now that uh, this was uh, known in a certain sense already. We're not claiming that this is a brand new theorem. Um, what we are claiming is that, well, we're going to look at a construction of this bi-graded bundle of Weyl algebras that uh, is, I think, a bit simpler than what we've seen before. And then we're going to be able to recreate, essentially recreate the result of Voronov. So we're reproving that result. Um, it's going to be, it is a different proof, and it doesn't use super geometry, and it's coordinate free. Okay. But this is not sort of a brand new result. This is uh, essentially, uh, was known by the people that I cited before in a slightly different uh, context. OK, so if we're going to talk about double Lie algebraids, we should start by talking about the things that underlie them, double vector bundles. And I'm just going to have to give you some quick facts here. Um, not pictured in this diagram is the core. So if QH denotes the horizontal projection, QV is the vertical one, the core is the intersection of these kernels. And I'm going to call the core E star. And because the core plays an important role in the theory of these double vector bundles, I'm going to start writing them like this. OK, so you can see that the <coughs> core is now pictured in the diagram. We then have another important bundle that uh, is related to the theory of this guy, which is called the fat bundle. I learned about this from uh, Raj and Alfonso's paper. Uh, they had gave a slightly different definition of this that we'll come to uh, later, show that it's the same as this one I'm giving here. Um, but this bundle is going to play an important role in the theory of these structures in that it gives this sequence. So this sequence, if we want to understand it on the level of sections, so uh, maybe I should mention that this means 1 comma 1 means the functions that are homogeneous of degree 1 uh, in each structure, so horizontally and vertically. Uh, now you can think of A star as being functions that are homogeneous of degree 0 vertically and 1 horizontally. And B star can be thought of as being degree 0 horizontally and 1 vertically. And so by taking the product, I should get something that's of degree 1 in each structure. That would be the first map. And any function that's of degree 1 on, in each direction on D will restrict to the core, give a linear function on the core. And since I'm calling the core E star, the linear functions on the core should be the, the 
bundle that has that as sections should be E. Okay, so that's a nice description of this sequence. So let's look at some examples. There's the decomposed one. Here, A, B, and E star are just any three vector bundles over M. I can build uh, a diagram like this that turns out to be a double vector bundle. In the same way that we've, uh, that vector bundles can be described entirely in terms of their uh, scalar multiplications. Matthias told us that in the, for those of us that were in the uh, school, a double vector bundle can be described with two scalar multiplications. And the one here is, in some sense, the obvious one. I multiply the first and third component or the second and third component. Okay. The uh, fat bundle, then, is just this. Okay. Uh, as you can see, if uh, something is linear in this, that's E and A star. And here it's linear in this, it's E and B star. And the DVB sequence is the split one. Okay. And I just want to point out here that uh, you could think of E star as sitting inside E hat. So this decomposed bundle sits naturally inside another one. OK, and then our other main example here will be the tangent prolongation. So let V be any vector bundle. Then uh, it was shown by McKenzie that TV is a double vector bundle. Okay. Here the scalar multiplication, uh, the vertical one, well, this is just a tangent bundle. So this is just the usual, usual scalar multiplication and whenever you take the tangent of a manifold. And the other one is the tangent lift of the, usual, of the scalar multiplication in V. Uh, here, it turns out that the fat bundle can be identified with sections of the jet bundle, the first jet bundle of V star. And the way that goes is you take a, a linear function on TV and you associate to it. Here, sigma of phi would be the um, the corresponding function on, it's, a, it's the lift of the corresponding function of, uh, sorry, sigma is, sigma phi is the section of V star that corresponds to the linear function. Okay. So phi is in particular the lift of a linear function on V. That gives me a section of V star, and then I can take the first jet of that. And the DVB sequence is the usual jet sequence. So the first jet bundle of any vector bundle always comes in a sequence like this, in particular for V star. This is what it looks like. OK. Now you've noticed I've been talking about this DVB sequence that's associated to uh, the fat bundle. And that's because it was shown by Chen Lu and Sheng, actually, that these sequences are essentially, of vector bundles that look like this, are essentially equivalent to double vector bundles. They form a category, and there's an equivalence of categories. So I want to look at how it comes about. How do I get a double vector bundle out of a sequence like this? Well, what I do is I take the decomposed one, and then I just insist sort of the natural thing on this map, right? That uh, if I dualize this sequence, I get a, uh, an element from A tensor B into E hat, I should, or sorry, from E hat into A tensor B, I should get this relation. Okay. As I mentioned, this was shown to be an equivalence of categories. Now you can define what a morphism between two such things should be, uh, and so on, and that's what they did, and showed that these are essentially equivalent ways to describe the same objects. So these DVB sequences I've been showing you actually, at the level of just double vector bundles, contain the information of the double vector bundle. And what I want to point out in the process of how you go from this one to this one is that it shows in particular that D sits inside a decomposed one. So we're going to use this to our advantage later in our construction that we're going to study the decomposed ones and then try to inject D inside that to get the answer for D. Okay? So as I mentioned, our strategy for constructing these Veil algebras, well, the first thing is they they're, in some sense, super symmetric or super commutative versions of polynomials. But on a double vector bundle, we don't just have polynomials, we have double polynomials because we have two scalar multiplications. And we could talk about something being of degree p for one of them and degree k for the other, for example. Uh, so here, SD is going to be a bigraded algebra of these bihomogeneous functions, which we'll call, or sorry, SD is a, a bundle whose sections will be these double polynomial functions. 
And we notice that this should be a contravariant functor via pullback, and so this uh, injection that I told you about later should produce a surjection the other way. Um, now here, I'm um, being a bit careful that all these things have the same total base manifold M, otherwise I have to change my definition of morphism a little bit here, but uh, since the base the total base is M, this is going to be fine. And so in terms of Ve algebras, we should expect Ve to be a quotient of the Ve algebra we compute for a decomposed temple vector bundle. Okay. So what we're going to look at then is this sort of overall strategy. We're first going to construct uh, SD where uh, it has the sections, these double polynomial functions, for a decomposed double vector bundle where it should be a little more clear what the answer is. Then we, get a, we take a quotient to get SD and we're going to anti-symmetrize the result to get W of D. Okay. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, this should have sections, the by degree KL functions, so they by degree, or sorry, degree K homogeneous in the first uh, scalar multiplication, degree L homogeneous in the second. <clears throat> Since D hat is decomposed, the polynomial functions in D hat are just this graded tensor product of polynomial functions in, uh, well, B, a, B, and uh, E hat. Okay. So you can do this uh, essentially sort of linear algebra computation. If we have the case of a double vector space, meaning M is a point, uh, then remember earlier I mentioned that the decomposed double vector bundle A cross B cross E sits inside a cross B cross E hat in this sort of natural way given by this DVB sequence. And so if I want to quotient out <coughs> to get just S of D now, then this is the appropriate quotient to take based on that uh, injection I had earlier. Right? <coughs> and once you know it for M being a point, um, you can essentially use the theory of, of principal bundles to, to say what it is everywhere. So this is essentially the definition we end up with for Ve algebras, which is an anti-symmetric version of this. So I should mention here that the A star would have by degree 1, 0, B star has by degree 0, 1, and E has by degree 1, 1. Okay? So that's how the bigrading works. And so if I want to anti-symmetrize, the odd elements A and B should be replaced with wedge, but the even elements have by degree 1, 1, I don't need to switch those to a wedge, okay? Those are, should still be a symmetric power. So then I end up with this definition for the Ve algebra bundle. <coughs> okay, so that's, uh, that's the description just in the theory of double vector bundles, and for any double vector bundle, you can associate this. What we should look at now is if I start putting Lie algebraid structures on this double vector bundle and ask for certain compatibility, uh, that's when I want to arrive at differentials on this bigraded algebra. <clears throat> so the way to do that is, I mentioned there's another way to define this fat bundle, and it's in terms of what are called linear and core sections. So here I have D, and I can wedge it as a vector bundle over A, because it's in particular a vector bundle over A, and then I can look at sections of that bundle. And there's a natural way to call these uh, to describe homogeneity of such things. Namely, the scalar multiplication map induces one here, and then you just impose the usual condition of homogeneity, except that uh, on one side of the section you have the scalar multiplication in D, and on the other you have this wedge scalar multiplication. So I would want uh, degree minus K, because I have sort of K forms, I should think of that as being a wedge of K uh, sections of D that have to homogeneous degree minus one. Then for linear, I want essentially one linear section wedged, the, so degree zero, if I'm describing it in terms of pullback, wedged with K minus one forms of degree minus one. All right, and the other thing to know that's gonna be important about double vector bundles is that they don't have a duality theory anymore, they have a triality theory, okay? so. Whenever you have one, you actually end up with three. And the way, for example, to construct this one is I take uh, this bundle and I dualize it, and that gives me this one. 
Now that's not gonna still be a vector bundle over A, but McKenzie uh, in studying these theories showed that you get a vector bundle over E, and the core is now A star. So that's why I've been calling the core by a star, you get this nice symmetric picture. If I decided to just call the core C, then I would have C star and A, and C star and A. And I would get uh, not as symmetric uh, picture. So similarly, this is uh, the dual of this bundle. And you can even show that, I mean, this bundle is dual to this one. Okay, so the horizontal bundle is always dual to the vertical one in the next uh, diagram. And then if I look at, well, what these things mean, sec the core sections of D prime over B are just the sections of E star. And similarly here, and this other definition I mentioned about the fat bundle, these are linear sections of D prime over B. So a linear section here corresponds to a function that's homogeneous of degree one for that structure um, because it's a section of D prime over B and D prime is dual to D. But because it's linear in the other structure, it ends up being equivalent to a bi-homogeneous function of degree one, one. So that's how the definition, uh, this one ends up being the same as the one I gave earlier. All right, but in particular, we might notice that, well, this is, uh, this is W11, and this is W01. So we can describe at least these two things in terms of our Ve algebras. And so I want to show that this is actually more general. These Ve algebras can be described as uh, linear sort of multi-sections of the bundle dual to the horizontal bundle here. So we get that if I just think of this as being graded, I get the, these sections of wedge of A star by identifying them with core sections of that bundle. And then if I fix a one here, I should get linear, these linear multi-sections. Now I don't have a lot of time, so there won't be almost any proofs in this talk, but I decided there should be uh, at least a, a sketch of one. So let's take a look at why this is true. The first thing, and we're going to take M to be a point here because as I sort of hinted at earlier, you can then use principal bundles to uh, make, make it true everywhere. <clears throat> okay, so what are the sections of D prime over B? Well, uh, these are all just vector spaces, and so they're just functions from B into uh, this uh, anti-symmetric, this sum of anti-symmetric products. But the elements here are homogeneous of degree minus j, okay, for the structure uh, in D prime. Okay, so the A star are like the core elements, have degree minus one, and these elements have degree zero. So in the end, a wedge of j sections of A star should have degree minus j. So if I want to make that into something of degree, say, uh, L, then I need to multiply by something of degree L plus J in B. But something of degree L plus J in B is, is a polynomial in B star, uh, so it's S L plus J. But this, if L is specialized to be minus K, this was uh, essentially the definition of W over M being a point, and when L is one minus K, uh, this is the definition of W, K, comma, one, because we just took it as this exterior product. Okay, so that means that, remember now, this is a Lie algebraids horizontally, and they should be linear, so Matthias talked about these VB structures uh, last week. Then, remember that the bundle dual to this, which is this one, this is like the the Cheval if I you know, forget about the linear for a minute, this is like the chevalier eilenberg complex for that Lie algebroid. And the fact that it's VB means that uh, the differential that you would get on this is linear. So the subcomplex of linear forms actually inherits a differential. Uh, and A, A is also Lie algebroid, so this is just the chevalier eilenberg complex of A, so it also comes with a differential. 
Okay, so then you can combine them because W0 and W1 generate everything. You can get a differential on the whole space uh, using the Leibniz rule. Okay. So the only thing you have to check is that in this quotient that I took, that's going to relate to the differential here and the differential here, and you, that, you have to check that that makes the Leibniz rule work. Um, but essentially, by construction, it does. Okay. Similarly, if it were a Lie algebraid in the vertical directions and horizontally vector bundles, you would get another differential, but now of by degree zero, one instead of one, zero. Okay. And so this is uh, the theorem then in this language that the compatibility condition, if I have a Lie algebraid in every direction, should be that these two differentials commute. Again, in the context of supergeometry, this was essentially Voronov's result. Um, and so this we gave, in using this construction, you can give a new proof of this. Uh, essentially, the, the proof goes that, well, by the, along the lines of what I just mentioned, that you, you're just checking that the Leibniz rule extends in the way that you think it should. Now, if we look at a double Lie algebra, the duality th uh, theory becomes a little different. Well, this isn't going to be a Lie algebra, but it's going to be, its dual is a Lie algebra, so it's Poisson. And so you could describe these as having their Lie algebra in one direction and some suitable Poisson structure in the other. But that means that the wedge of forms doesn't get a Lie algebra differential, right? If I, if I take D prime over B and I look at the wedge of that bundle, I'm not going to get a differential on that because D prime is not a Lie algebra. But I get a bracket, right, from the Poisson bracket in D. Okay, so you still have your horizontal differential here because it's horizontally a Lie algebra. But vertically, you don't get a differential, you get a bracket coming from the Poisson structure. Okay. Uh, and the compatibility condition is that this horizontal differential is a derivation of that bracket. And similarly, you get the same thing going on over here. <clears throat> so let's take a look at an example just to get a bit grounded. Uh, if I look at this example, then W0 is just forms on M, which are thought of as basic forms via pullback on A. So I'm thinking of these as forms on A. And then the linear forms are given by uh, 1, and you just have the Durham differential. Similarly, uh, in the other direction, I get uh, these derivations of this exterior uh, algebra. And the differential is, well, the chevalier eilenberg differential is a derivation here. And so I'm taking the lead derivative of derivations along that derivation. Okay. And if I look over now at T star A, so obviously T A star would be the same with A's replaced by A stars. T star A gives me the linear multivector fields, and this bracket that I was talking about that we get instead of a differential is the Skouten bracket of multivector fields. Okay. So I just want to mention, uh, last minute or two, if you allow me to go slightly over time, uh, some where these things might appear in the literature. Uh, well, remember that we talked about IM forms. I believe Tiago talked about them if you were in the school. These are the infinitesimal version of multiplicative forms on Lie groupoids. Uh, so you can define them in this way. You know they sit inside the linear multivector fields, which we just showed was a Vale algebra. And you're asking that, if you think of it as der multi-derivations, you're asking that it's a derivation of the bracket, okay. the scout and bracket. Differential forms also sit inside the linear uh, forms. And they admit a description uh, as well. And it was shown by Enrique and Alejandro that uh, you, you can see them as, remember that the linear forms are this guy. And so the in infinitesimal multiplicative forms are exactly the linear forms that are closed under the horizontal differential. Okay. Now then we, because we now have sort of a triality of, of Weyl algebras, so there's one that uh, we can describe the multiplicative vector fields in the same way. Okay, so this was the linear multivector fields, and then we're looking at those that are closed. Okay, so 
basically what's going on here is that these linear multivector fields decompose. This was the original way that uh, infinitesimal multiplicative forms, uh, this is how they were defined. And you get a morphism of graded Lie algebras here. In the case that it's TM, this is an isomorphism, and then we recover these brackets on vector-valued forms that uh, were studied by Nyhaus and other authors before. So the frolicker nyhaus bracket is what you get on this first component, and the nyhaus richardson bracket is what you get on the second. So the frolicker nyhaus is probably most famous in complex geometry where you can use it to check if your almost complex plus on structure is complex, or your almost, yeah, your almost complex structure is complex. And Nyhaus Richardson, I believe they used it to study deformations of Lie algebras, is where that came from. So the last thing that I want to talk about is these Van Est maps. So remember that if you have a Lie group, the Van Est map relates the cohomology of G to the cohomology of its Lie algebra. Okay. So it's a map of complexes. Here to the chevalier eilenberg complex, and here's just the groupoid cohomology. Now, this has been generalized to a number of different settings at, by Weinstein and Shu to Lie algebra, uh, if G is a Lie groupoid. Uh, then uh, by Raj for Q groupoids and Q algebroids. These are uh, sort of a super geometric uh, version of that. Then uh, this map was understood as a map of double complexes where the Weyl algebra of A is, is the domain. It was then, among other things, so. Uh, Alejandro and Tiago talk about Van Est for homogeneous cochains. So in particular, they got a map uh, at the VB level. And then uh, Angulo and his thesis did Lie 2 groups to Lie 2 algebras. So in the context of double structures, we would want basically something like this. We have double Lie groupoids, and if we integrate, or sorry, differentiate one time, we get what's called an LA groupoid. Differentiate again in the other direction is when how we arrive at double Lie algebroids. And we would want sort of a system like, of maps like this from double Lie groupoids into double Lie algebroids where the domain is this Weyl algebra. Okay, so this map is, if I understand correctly, essentially Raja's map for Q groupoids. And so we'd want to build one from here to here that sort of factors through Raja's map. We would expect this to have applications in sort of rigidity theory and, and stuff like that for these double structures. Okay, sorry for taking a few more minutes of your time than I anticipated, but uh, I'll end there. So thanks for, thanks for listening.